open our Bibles tonight to the book of Isaiah chapter 64. I've been teaching and ministering a subject on the ways that God speaks to us, and actually I've been speaking on 20 ways that we can hear from God, or 20 ways that God speaks to us. And it's very important that we hear from God. And, and actually, we, we know Christianity is Christ. We know it's Jesus. But let me also say this. Christianity is doing what Adam did before he sinned. And what was that? He walked with God. That, that's what Christianity is. Christianity is walking with God. I like to explain it this way. God said it was not good for the man to be alone. So he put the man to sleep and he took out of his side a rib and he created a woman. And when Adam saw the woman, he said, now she is not bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh and we shall be one. Now, God's plan was for that woman to be at the side of that man 24-7. That was God's plan. We don't know what happened in the garden. It seems to me somehow they got separated. And when we get separated from God is when we get into trouble. And we can be easily deceived because the woman in the garden is the typology of the bride or the body or the believer in the New Testament church. So we need to be connected to the Father 24-7. Now we know that Jesus was because even at 12 years old, he, he said, I must be about my Father's business. So there is, there is a possibility of being connected to the Father and not just spiritually, but mentally, I'm going to say this, emotionally and physically 24 hours a day with God. Wait a minute, physically. He said, I'll, he said, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwell in you, he'll quicken your mortal body. In the old covenant, Moses walked with God and at the age of 120 years old, it says his eyes were not dim and his strength was not abated. And that's old covenant. So that means there's a possibility of us walking so close to God to where we know exactly what it is he wants to do 24-7. Man, that's amazing to me. You can walk so close to God. As a matter of fact, that's why Jesus said all things are possible. Jesus walked with his father 24-7. He knew. And matter of fact, he was so connected to his father. I, 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 if you can imagine, it's like in his mind, he's saying, what should, I do? what should I say, father? He said, say this, and he said it. Now what should I do? And he did it. Now where shall I go? And he went there. 24-7. And matter of fact, when he went down to get baptized by John the Baptist in the River Jordan, the father said, today's the day. Go down. So we're talking about being led by God. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, the other sons of God. Of course, the Greek word weos means mature sons, maturity. When you get mature in God, you'll begin to walk with God. you begin to hear the voice of God. And there's 20 ways that God speaks to us. But let me say this. You have got to want to hear the voice of God. You have got to want to be in his will. And what he is going to tell you to do is not what your flesh is going to want to do. He's going to take you the other way. He said, there is a way which seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. And so there's a way of the flesh, a way of the carnal mind, and then there's the way of the spirit. And if you walk in the spirit, you do not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We overcome the flesh by the spirit. How do we do that? Submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Now, now I heard this was a true story. I can't verify it. There was a, 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 a woman who worked at um, like a Walmart. And she really, really had been wanting to walk with God and hear the voice of God and obey God and one day she's standing at the counter and all of a sudden she heard the still small voice of the Lord and say, go up against that wall right in front of her, stand on your head and put your feet up against the wall. She rebuked it. She said, this can't be God. It came to her again. It came up out of her heart. It came, didn't come from the head. It came out of her heart. We're going to talk about this tonight. It came up out of her heart, very strong. Well, she had known the voice of God through the years to some extent and she knew she knew this was God, but she thought, that's got to be crazy. That can't be God. It came to her again. She finally said, okay. He, and he said to her, he said, I thought you said you were willing to do whatever I told you to do. She, she said, okay. Okay, God. So she goes over, puts her head down, 
gets her feet up, and she's sitting there. She's up, got her, now she's standing at her head in the store looking out. As she's looking out, she sees this young man who had, was next in line. He's at the counter, and he begins to weep and cry. He's weeping and crying, seeing her on her head with her feet up against the wall. And the Lord spoke to her and said, now go, lead him to me. So she got down. She went over. She shared Christ. He gave his heart to Jesus right then and there. And then they got to talking and said, why did you start weeping? He said, because I said this. I said, I'm going to kill myself today. I'm going to take my life. I'm tired of living. And God, if you're really there, God, if you really care about me, I need a sign from heaven. If you really, really love me, otherwise I'm going to take my life. I need a sign from heaven. He said, Lord, this is what I want. I want a person to stand on their head for me. And she went over there, stood on her head, put her feet. And he said, God, you're real. You're really real. And he gave his heart to Christ. I think it's very important for us to hear from God. I, um, I was walking across, and what we're talking about is we're going to talk about perceiving the voice of God or perceiving the will of God. So I'm, I'm down in the Gettysburg Square one day, and <clears throat> I looked over a black gentleman. There was an African-American gentleman all the way across the square, and I perceived I was supposed to go speak to him. I perceived it. Now, when I use the word perceive, and I'm going to show you this, I'm not talking about I was guessing, I was thinking, I was assuming. I just, it came up, and actually the word perceive, if you study this in the Hebrew and the Greek, it means to know, to understand, to see. I knew I was supposed to go talk to him. I didn't hear the still small voice of God. I just knew. Have you ever been walking along and you just knew God wanted you to do something. Now, we've been talking about the way that God speaks to us. Now, we talked about, first of all, the first way that God speaks to us is through Jesus. Look at Jesus. That's the voice of the Father, the express image of his person, okay, the brightness of his glory. Number two is by the word of God. By the word of God, looking at Jesus. Number three was what we would call our conscience. Every man is born with a conscience. You have a conscience. And number four was by the still small voice. So number five we're looking at is you're going to perceive it. It's not coming from your head. You're not guessing it. You're not thinking it. You're not, you, you just know. It's in your knower. I just know that I know that I know. And, and let me say this. This is very important. This is also how all your prayers are answered because actually it's the voice of faith. You just know that when you prayed, it was done. That's why it says, whatever things you desire when you pray, believe that you receive and you shall have. But only you can know if it's done. Now, there's sometimes people are operating in the gifts of the Spirit, the word of knowledge, the word of wisdom, maybe the gift of faith, miracles. I told one guy one time, I called him out. I, just, he, I was preaching in a tent in the Huntington Fair, and I saw a man, young man walking by in a pair of crutches and the Spirit of God, and, and, and I just knew this. I just knew the gift of faith was operating. I said, young man, you that are walking across, and all these people are watching. We're next to the farmer's uh, 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 bingo stand. You know, they had a big, big old, big, and I'm preaching in there, and this guy's walking by, and I caught him on. I said, you young man, you young man, walking with the crutches. He looked at me, and I said, come up here. God's going to heal you right now. He kept on walking. It took three times before he finally came. When he finally came, he got to me, and all of these people are watching now. They think, I had more people outside the tent than in the tent, you understand. Now, I could probably sit about 100 people in the tent. And I said to him, I said, I'm going to pray. And I said, God is going to heal you. Do you believe that? He said, I don't know. You called me up here. See, it's the gift of faith. I knew he was going to be healed. I knew it. And so then I said to him, I said, well, I'm going to pray and God's going to heal you. So I laid my hands on him. I commanded his leg to be healed. I didn't know what was wrong. I just said, I command your leg to be healed, your knee to be healed. And I said, okay, now throw down your crutch and, 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 and walk. And, and he wouldn't throw it down. So I grabbed this crutch. Everybody saw it. I, a good friend of mine was there. My wife was there. I threw down his crutch. I spun him around and I pushed him. When I pushed him, he went falling forward and he began to take off and he began to walk. 
He began to weep uncontrollably. He began to cry. He come up front, finally he's walking back and forth on a sawdust trail. I give him the microphone. I said, tell everybody what happened to you. He said, sir, you don't understand. You don't understand, so tell us what happened. He said, a year ago, last winter, not a year, it was, it was in the wintertime, he said, I was walking down a sidewalk. He said, I slipped on ice. I fell down on that kneecap. I believe it was a right kneecap. He said, I shattered it. I, I, he said, they were going to operate on me and give me a new kneecap in about two weeks. He said, I haven't bent that knee in, 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 in ever since I had that accident. He went back. I said, I'll tell you what you do. You go back. You tell your doctor what happened. Get it x-rayed and come back and tell us. He said he walked into the doctor's office. They saw him walking normal without his crutches. And they said, what happened to you? And he told them the story. They x-rayed him, and he had a brand new kneecap. Glory to God. Hallelujah. These things are real, man. Hallelujah. But I heard the voice of God. But I just knew, I perceived, God's going to heal you right now. But you need, uh, many times when you pray, see, people say, only pray once. No, 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 no. Keep praying until you know, until you know it's done. you got to know it in your heart. you got to know it in your knower. You gotta, and when you know it's done, you're going to begin to thank God. If you're not thanking God after you prayed, you really don't know it's done. Now, I'm convicting myself. <laughs> if you don't have this, thank the Lord you heard me, you don't really know it in your heart. you got to go back and, begin to meditate upon the truth of what God's word says. But it says here in verse 4 of Isaiah 64, For since the beginning of the world men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, neither have the eye seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. Well, wait, he just said, No man has seen, no man has understood by the ear, by the eye. And what he's really talking about is your natural realm. Your natural. Now, this actually is, a re, it's repeated in the New Testament a little bit different. It says, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither enter in the heart of man those things which God has prepared for them that love him. Then it says something different though. But God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit, for his spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. So, when God speaks to you, you may even think it's coming from your physical eyes, from your head, from your physical ears, but it really isn't. It's coming from the Spirit. The Spirit is speaking. The Spirit is revealing. The Spirit is showing you things. And so this is not psychological. That's why it says the carnal mind cannot understand the things of God. See, I know many times, I know I'm healed. I know it. I know it. I perceive I'm healed, even though my flesh is telling me I'm not, even though it, everything in the natural says I'm not. I just know it. I perceive. I perceive. And matter of fact, if you look up the word perceive and just a little bit of homework, and you guys need to examine and make sure what I'm saying is right, if look up the word perceive or perceived, and you'll discover many, many times, it says, and they perceived, and he perceived, or she perceived, and even Jesus said that. And I just want to give you a couple of scriptures along this line, and I'm going to talk about how many times I perceived certain things. How do we know, Pastor Mike, that what you perceived was really of God? Because there was evidence to it. The proof in the pudding is in the eating. And if you're really hearing from God, it's going to be manifested. And, and, you know, here's the other thing about how God speaks. You know, if, if there's many different colors, isn't there? There's red, green, blue, orange, yellow, you name it, brown, black. There's all kinds of colors. There's all kinds of ways. It's still color. It's still paint. It's just a different, it's just a different uh, a pigment. When God speaks to us in many ways, it's still one in the same spirit. You know, he that operates in the gifts... Word of knowledge, word of wisdom, discerning of spirits, gift of faith, miracles, healing, tongues, interpretation, prophecy. It's all still the same spirit. He's just speaking to you and revealing things to you. Man, we need to hear the voice of God. We need to hear from heaven. I'm not trying to seek to hear the voice of God. I am seeking God. 
but I am believing he will speak to me. See, this all operates by faith. It says, he therefore that ministereth to you the spirit and worketh miracles among you, does he do it by the works of law or by the hearing of faith? I believe I can hear from God. And here's the thing. I'm telling you once again, I believe, I, I know that a lot of times that people don't want to hear from God. Because when you hear from God, it crucifies your flesh. When you hear from God, you're not doing your own thing. You're not going your own way. You're no longer your own. You're his. And, 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 and I, I, I really think the reason why a lot of people are not hearing from, well, they won't even believe what this book says. They won't even do what the book says. So that they, they say, you know, it says, you, with your lips you say you love me, but your heart is far from me. You say, I love you, I love you, I love you, Lord. And, he, and, 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 he's, and you pick up his book and you read what he says to do and you don't do it. So who, you're not deceiving God, you're deceiving yourself. Because the Bible says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Now, David, and I'm just going to give you some scriptures and you can look them all up later on, 2 Samuel 5, 12. It says, and David perceived that the Lord had established him king over Israel and that he had exalted his kingdom for his people Israel's sake. And, and the word perceive means to realize, to understand, to see, to know. How did he do that? In the eye of his heart. The eyes of your understanding. In the eyes of his heart. See, your spiritual heart has eyes. Your eyes can see things in the heart. Your mind, your head has eyes, but your heart has eyes that the eyes of your understanding might be enlightened, it says in Ephesians. So he perceived in his heart. He didn't guess it. He didn't think it. He, he wasn't assuming it. He just knew in his heart. There's lots of times I knew things in my heart. Many times I've gone into hospitals and I went to pray for people, and I knew in my heart that they weren't going to get healed. It wasn't because it wasn't God's will that they got healed, didn't get healed. I did a teaching one time. I'll probably never do it again because sometimes there's things you shouldn't teach because the enemy can actually take the truth and use it against people. And I did a teaching one time, 30 reasons why people can't get healed. 30 reasons why people can't get healed. And a lot of times, what the, and it's truth, I've talked to, matter of fact, there's been times when the Lord spoke things to me. I was so excited about it. I was so enthused about it, but I was stupid. I got up in the pulpit and I preached it. And I, I literally, people ran out the door. You know why? Because they weren't ready for it. Remember, Paul said, I want to give you meat. He said, but I can't give you meat. I remember not too long ago, I was preaching what Paul preached about when I was a child, I spake as to the thought as a child. And so I'm just showing him what Paul said to people he could not give meat to, and I perceived it was too much for people here to hear what Paul was preaching to people who could not handle meat, and we lost people. Now, how can that be? How could I be teaching things to people that Paul taught to the Corinthians because I can't give you anything more heavy duty than this because you can't handle it, and yet this generation can't even handle that. We're in trouble. We're in trouble, man. People don't really, they say they want to hear from God, but where God's going to take them is where the flesh don't want to go. And David perceived, David saw God has established him as king and his seed for all generations. Where did that come from? It came from the Spirit of God. Okay, and so uh, in Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 12, you know, Nehemiah ran into a man, and his name was Shimea, and Shimea began to tell him, well, God wants you to go into the temple, and he wants you to wait there for him. And, and he said this, Lo, I perceived that God had not sent him, but that he pronounced this prophecy against me. You've you got to perceive this word this man just gave me. Not, it's not coming out of your thinking, your reasoning. This word this man has given me, it's not God. He's trying to manipulate me. Why can't people understand that? When, 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 when you go to meetings, people don't, 
I had a friend of mine, actually I went to a well-known minister's meeting. I didn't know he was into money. I began to perceive things. I'm not trying to lean with my understanding. You understand, when I, when I go into a place, first of all, I got to make sure everything they're saying is the word of God. But I'm not using my head. I'm looking and I'm saying, you know, Lord, I'm a blind man, but you're not, so you tell me what's going on. I began to perceive some things were not right. And I said to my wife, I said, let's get out of here. So we got up and we walked out. Well, a friend of mine had been in that same man's meetings. And he said, this is what happened. He said, at the end of the service, he talked about seeing Jesus and seeing angels. He said, okay, now tonight we're going to have two lines. He said, over here, anybody who wants to see Jesus, come here. And anybody who wants to see an angel, come there. He says, now, he said, if you want to see Jesus, it's $50. This really happened. He said, if you want to see an angel, it's $10. This little lady came up, and she was saying, oh, brother, so-and-so, I don't have $50, but I want to see Jesus so bad. And he said, no, no, you believe God for $50. Then you come back and had her pushed out of the line. But I said, now, brother Ron, he's a pastor up in Bangor, Maine. I said, Ron, I said, nobody fell for that, right? Nobody for that said, Brother Michael, almost everybody was in line. I said, no way. What is wrong? They're not perceiving. Why couldn't they perceive that wasn't God? I, I, I mean, I know pastors that will go into ministers' meetings and they will literally just suck the money out of them and they don't perceive it's not God. They have eyes they can't see, ears they can't hear. Why can't they? I think it's because they really don't. They're not, they got their own agendas. They're not really just, God, your will, not my will. Let your will be done, not my will be done. It says in Job 33, 14, for God speaketh once, and this is a very important scripture, and you can go and read the whole context because we're going to use it later on about dreams. It says, for God speaketh once, yea, twice, Yet man perceiveth it not. He, he, what do you mean that he doesn't perceive it? He doesn't grasp it. He doesn't hear it. He doesn't see it. He doesn't know it. Why doesn't he know it? Well, because I, 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 I think the problem is they don't really have a heart for God. I think that's what's going on. Uh, Matthew 6, and there's so many scriptures dealing with this, many, many. But when Jesus, when Jesus, which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, Oh, you have little faith, why reason ye among yourself? Because you have brought no bread. Now, he's out on the ship, and he says, Beware of the bread of the Pharisees, right? And right away, you know, he, he can't hear what they're physically saying, but he's perceiving that they're totally misunderstanding what he has just said. They're perceiving He's perceiving. The Spirit of the Lord is revealing to him. It's, he's not hearing a word. He's not hearing the Father say, they are discussing this because they did not see you feed the multitudes. Now, here's the amazing thing. He, caught, he took the fish and the loaves, and he fed the 5,000 men, not including the women and children. There is 12 baskets left over, but they did not perceive he had done a miracle. How can that be? It says that in Deuteronomy. It says that they didn't perceive that God destroyed the I I Egyptians, though they saw him do it. They didn't perceive the miracles of the manna and the water and the fire and the cloud. Why didn't they perceive it? They had eyes, they had ears, but they couldn't see and they couldn't hear. Hard hearts. I'm telling you the reason why they couldn't see God. They had their own agenda. They had their own agenda. And as long as you can't serve God and mammon, you can't, you know, it says, by, by all of these signs, you're going to see. I'm, gonna, I'm about ready to come back, Jesus said. Why ain't the house of God full of people right now? Why isn't every service filled with people crying, weeping, saying, God, we know you're coming back and we got loved ones that aren't saved. They don't know you. Why? Because they have eyes they can't see. They have ears they can't. I don't know about you. I have a sense of urgency in my heart. We're running out of time. We're running out of time. Man, we got to do something for God. But they have eyes they can't see. They have ears they can't hear. And they have hearts they cannot perceive. They cannot perceive what is happening. 
And, and like I said, time and time again, I, I knew, listen, there's times when I, you can't judge my heart. I'm not judging hearts. I'm telling you how many times that I perceive things about people. I never tell them. I'm not judging their heart. I'm not going by the mind. I'm not going by the intellect. I cannot tell you how many times people walked into the sanctuary and the Lord spoke to me and said, they're a pedophile. And I said, okay, Lord. And I took, I took steps to pr protect the flock. They're a thief. I mean, there's times when the Lord told me things about people and I argued with them. I said, no way, God, that, no way, no. Uh -uh. And, and then he would begin to speak, speak to me with his still small voice because I'm not thinking here. I'm not thinking here. And matter of fact, this happened. I had, a, I had an older gentleman that I was trying to help, and when I met him, I perceived he was a pedophile. I perceived he was. And I said to this gentleman, I said, I said to him, I, I took him aside and said, listen, let me ask you something. I said, I, I'm not trying to embarrass you. Ha, have you ever molested children? Oh, no, no, no. I, I've never molested children because I perceived he had. But, oh, I must be missing you, God. This, I must not be right. This, God, this is not right. And then my son Daniel standing there, and this guy came onto the property, and Danny runs from this, but he operates in a realm of the prophetic at times, and he came to me and he said, Dad, that man's a pe pedophile. And I said, no, 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 Danny. I said, you're wrong. I already asked him. Dad, I'm telling you, he is a pedophile. I said, how do you know? He said, I had a vision when I seen him. He said, I saw him chasing a little girl around the house trying to get her to molest her. I'm telling you, Dad. I said, okay, because he was really upset. I said, okay. So I took him aside again, and I just looked in his eyes. I said, now you told me you were not, and you have never been a pedophile. I said, now I need to know the absolute truth. And he hung his head. He said, I, I have been. I said, okay. I don't want to know the details. Tell me. It was my niece. It was only one time. It was only one time, but it was my niece. We got we to, gotta, man, it, it's not here. I know a lot of people operate in suspicion. I mean, a lot of people say, Pastor Mike, God told me such and such about so and so, and I knew, somebody just told me this the other day something, and I knew in my heart it wasn't God. But, but how do you know? Because, listen, you can't go home and watch TV. You can't watch sec read secular books. You can't listen to secular music and hear from heaven. I'm sorry, you just can't. You, you ain't going to hear from heaven. You're going to hear all kinds of voices. And so, but it says in Matthew 22, 18, it says, but Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? So right now they were trying to set him up with a question. Remember what they would bring to him and said, uh, they said to him, well, should we pay taxes to Caesar? He said, well, it was obvious that that they were trying to trap him. No, it wasn't. They said to him, said, should we pay taxes? He said he perceived right away they were trying to get him killed. He said, okay, you got a coin. They pulled out a coin. He said, whose inscription's on this coin? Well, you tell, Caesar's. He said, pay to Caesar's what Caesar's and give to God what's God. They were always trying to snare him. We got to perceive what is going on. I had the township show up. And right away I perceived they were trying to snare me. Now, I didn't react to him the right way. But what the, and, and actually, they came and said, we hear you got homeless people living in your building. And I said, nah. and I didn't. I said, I don't got no homeless people. Well, we want to get in your building. Uh, well, I said, you're not going in our building. You have no right to go in our building, and I do not have homeless people going in our building. I didn't say, I won't lie. I just said, no, you're not going in. So they kept hounding me. And so finally, I said, I said, the supervisor showed up because I told him, I said, okay, I'll let you go through my building. But I said, let me ask one question. See, I had hired a local architect to take our gymnasium to draw plans to turn two-thirds of it into a two-story dormitory. And I said to the supervisors, I said to him, I said, have you been talking to such and such architect? They looked at, no, 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 no. I said, you have not, and I knew they were lying. I perceived they were lying, so I left it alone. Well, I went to the, the township supervisory board then because they came in, and I had no homeless people living in the building. And so I went to the meeting, 
And I said, now we need to talk about what happened the other day when you come to our building. And the woman spoke up, bowed her head and said, well, uh, Reverend Yeager, we, we, we did talk to such and such. I said, I knew it. I perceived you had. <laughs> but see, it's, it's, it floats up out of your, 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 your innermost being. You just, you just know these things. So Jesus perceived their wickedness. Um, and there's so many scriptures dealing with this. Um, and it, Jesus said that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven them. So notice the, the, the lack of being able to perceive is connected to not letting go of sin. We can't perceive what's going on. What's happening? I don't understand. You're hanging on to sin. And so therefore, it's like static in a radio. You just, because you won't, it could be the seed of bitterness, the seed of lust, the seed of fear. This, it could be, what, know what kind of sin it is, but you can't hear because you won't let go of something that is out of the will of God. Because if you did hear, you would have no excuse for it. I don't know about you, but I want to let go. How about you? I want to, I got to hear from God, man. I cannot tell you how many times I would have been dead if I would not have heard from God. Now, thank God for his mercy. And, and, and Jesus said this, Why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye? And this is very important. But perceivest not the beam that is in thy own eye. Now, I run into this all the time, all the time in the, in the body of Christ. I run into people who are so dogmatic about others, and yet they themselves are just as guilty, if not more guilty, than the person they're accusing. Now, this happened to me just last week. I mean, I was confronted with a man who is arrogant and proud and, and just in my face. And, and, and man, that man is full of pride. That man is full of arrogance. That man is, is, you know, not realizing that all he was doing is bringing that same thing that was in me out of me. Contention only cometh by pride. Strife only cometh by pride. Only cometh by pride. That's what it says. And yet I could not perceive that I was the problem. Oh, he had a problem. But see, I wasn't pulling the beam out of my own eyes. He says, how come you can see your brother's beam, but you can't see your beam? How come God can't convict you about what's wrong with you? People, listen to me, I'm telling you, the flesh always likes to talk about other people's flesh. And yet it says in James, Speak not evil one of another, brother. For he that speaketh evil of his brother and judges his brother, speaketh evil of the law and judges the law. But if thou art a judge of the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and destroy who art thou that judges another? Well, aren't we supposed to judge with righteous judgment? Yeah, righteous judgment is like the woman caught in sin. You want to rescue her. You want to help her. You're not speaking down. You're not condemning. You're not attacking her. Help me, Jesus. <laughs> Lord, I want to hear your voice so loud and clear, but I got to pull the beam out of my own eye. You know what? It's easy to pull the sliver out of your foot Sure hurts to pull it out of mine. How many know it's easy to pull a sliver out of somebody else's flesh? But it sure hurts to pull it out of yours. Oh, we're all guilty. Brother, we're all guilty. There ain't one person listening that is not guilty of looking at the beam in your whoever and not pulling it out because you don't perceive you got a problem but I know I'm the problem. But yet I don't know what that times. I know I'm the problem here, but there's sometimes I don't think I'm the problem. People don't want to hear this. And I'm not condemning people. People they need to be taught, they need to be trained, they need to be educated in the things of the Spirit. But really, there's not one thing that God will not do with any person if they will really, really get right with him. Jesus said that. He said, 
There's not one thing my Heavenly Father won't do for you. Now, what are we asking them to do? We're not asking them to, we're not asking according to our lust. He says in James, he said, you have not because you ask not when you ask, you ask a that to make consume it upon your lust. We're not talking about asking stuff for the flesh. See, that's the thing. We're not talking about asking stuff for your flesh. This flesh is going to pass away. So we're getting in. It, you see, how does this have to do with hearing the voice of God? Everything. Um, remember, Jesus fed the masses, and he said, and Jesus therefore perceived that they were come and taken by force to make him a king. He departed again into a mountain himself alone. Um, Acts 27, 10. Jesus, I mean, Peter, no, I mean, Paul, they're going to, they're, he's been taken a slave by the Romans. And he's headed to Rome, and they're going to take a voyage, and the season for sailing is basically done. But they got advice to go on a journey, and he said this unto them, Sirs, I perceive, I see, I know in my heart that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only of the lading and the ship, but also of our lives. And he, was, he heard right from heaven, man. He perceived it. He didn't, he didn't say... I heard the still small voice of God. I heard of all of those of God. I had a vision. I had an angel. I had a dream, though he, he did have all of those. But in this situation, he knew in his heart, perceived in his heart, this wasn't going to be a good journey. We need to get sensitive to God when it comes to these things. 1 John 3, 16. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Now, what does that mean? Hereby perceive we the love of God for us. Well, listen, let, let me give you an example. You know how many Christians are tormented because they go, I just don't know if God loves me. I just, I just, don't, I just don't feel like God loves me. I, I just don't feel like God cares about me. Well, something's wrong because he laid down his life for you. You ought to perceive he loves you. No matter how bad it gets, no matter how difficult it gets. See, I, 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 I believe I can say, and maybe when I get to heaven I'll find out I was deceived, that since I've been born again, I have never doubted God's love for me once. And you know why? And not just for me, for everybody. Because he died on a cross. God became a man. What more could he do? What more do you, what more evidence? Answered prayer to me is not evidence that God loves me, though it is the manifestation of God's love. You know what proves to me God loves me? He became a man. He took my sins and my iniquities, and he died for me. So number five is that we perceive. I'm, I'm just share some stories with you. I am. Um, Things I just, one time I was flying back from Alaska to the lower 48. I've never fly, I never fly first class. But I perceived, this was weird, I perceived I needed to fly first class. It just came, you need to fly, it, I didn't hear the still small voice of God, I just perceived I needed to fly. So I did, I got a, and the seat, and it was kind of a weird plane because the, 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 and I never, I've never f flew first class again from that time. It was the only time I flew first class. And so it was like I was right there in the peak. I was the very first chair. They had set their chairs up, and I'm kind of looking at the walls here. I'm right in the very nose of the plane. So we're coming in to land, I think, at O'Hare Airport, and I notice we're not landing. We're kind of circling around. And the pilot came over and said, uh, we uh, don't want you to be alarmed, but we've got a little bit of a, a problem. And they said, the problem is our nose wheel will not lock in. And he didn't go on, but I knew what he was saying. For in other words, when you're landing that much weight of a plane, that humongous 747, that nose plane, and if that, that wheel, guess what? You're eating, you're eating concrete, man. And so I'm sitting there, and the Lord spoke to my heart. Now, you see, he says, that's why I put you here. I said, what, Lord? He said, I wanted to put you here because you can pray and believe, and that way this plane won't have an accident. Right there, he put me in the front. I said, okay, God. So I began to pray. I said, Lord, in the name of Jesus, I'm praying. You know, and I have no fear. And you know what? We came in. 
And they and, and they had they had they had the fire trucks there and they had the emergency because they didn't know what was going to happen and they came in and they landed and we and it never collapsed. But I perceived I needed to go first class. That's kind of weird stuff, ain't it? Okay. Uh, listen, here's something a little bit different. I had a young couple in our church, Dave and Cheryl. <clears throat> She had, I think she had negative blood, he had positive blood, and that's very dangerous, you know, when they mix it. Uh, and when you get pregnant. And she got pregnant. And I perceived things weren't going right. And then she went and got a sonogram, and they told her the baby was dead. I perceived the baby was dead. They came to us. Pastor Mike... We're believing, we're believing, we're believing that this baby is alive. But I perceived the baby was dead and it was not going to be brought back to life. Now, this is a very difficult situation because I don't want to discourage them. I don't want to put down their faith. But they were not in faith. They weren't operating in faith. And I, I didn't, God didn't give me a gift of faith for that to raise that child from the dead in her womb. So what did you do? So I said, are you sure you really are believing God? Oh, yeah, Pastor Mike, we're really believing God. We're really trusting God. This baby's alive, and we're really believing God. So I'm a young pastor, man. I don't know what to do because I perceive they're not operating in faith. I perceive they're not believing God. I perceive it's all in their head, but I don't know what to do. Now, what I do a lot of time in these situations, I've been there. I, I just... I can't tell you exactly what I do every time because it's difficult. So I said, okay, we'll, we'll agree with you. Well, she almost died because that baby was left in her womb so long it began to rot. Next thing you know, the organization I was ordained, now I wasn't ordained to them, but I came, these, this couple got, Dave and Cheryl got so mad at me, bitter at me, they blamed me because I was teaching them this foolish faith message. And they caught up the college I went through and they blackballed my name and my wife. And I'm telling you for a while, I don't know if we're still on a blacklist, made us look like we were the guilty ones because we were so fanatical to have them believe a dead baby in the womb was alive when it really wasn't but I didn't know what to do about it. I perceived they weren't believing God. It's difficult, man. Sometimes I just don't know what to do. Say, Lord, okay, I, I know in my heart they're not really trusting you. Everybody's making a good confession. Everybody's saying, oh, they'll live and not die. Everybody's saying it's going to be all right, but I, I know it's not going to be. So a lot of times when I've gone into hospitals and I walk in, a lot of times, usually the Lord tell me right away, he'll usually either through I perceive it or he'll, speak to my heart, and he'll say to me, they're not going to live. This is on to death. And so what do you do? I just make sure they're right with God. That's what I do. I make sure they're right with God, and I walk out, and, I, and all these people are standing around. They're standing around, and they're, they're, they're speaking. They're speaking. We just had this here not, not happened too long ago, that a young lady in our church who came here, she had a stroke about three years ago, and they wanted me to go down, I lay hands on her, going to raise her up. But the Lord said, she ain't going to recover. And she ain't coming out of this. And so I, I didn't go. Everybody, a bunch of people went down there, speaking, speaking, speaking life over her, speaking life over her. Kenneth Hagin told a story one time that there was a well-known evangelist, and they were all in this great big meeting, and they got a phone call and said this well-known evangelist was in the hospital, and they wanted all these other evangelists to come and pray for this evangelist. And Kenneth Hagin said he began to walk towards the front when the Lord said, go sit down, I'm taking him home. He's gotten into pride and rebellion. I'm taking him home, go sit down. So he turned around and went back and sat down, didn't tell nobody, and he went home. We have got to hear from God. We have got to hear from God. Now, I, I teach this stuff. I, you know, I, I'm teaching this stuff I've never taught before because I know people can 
get into unbelief. I don't know. Is it God's will to heal them? Yes, it's God's will to heal them. How about this? I know it's God's will to save people, but I know there's people who will never be saved. I know they won't be saved. And they died and went to hell. I, I was... I was preaching here one day, and I looked out, and I perceived there was a man sitting out here to my left. In three months, he would be dead if he did not get up off his couch and go to work for God. I said it over the pulpit. I didn't point to him after the service. He never comes and talks to me. He came and began to talk to me. And I said, brother, that was you. What? I said, you got to get up off your couch. I said, you'll be dead in three months. I said, you got to get up and do something for God. You're talented. You're gifted. Well, he never did. In three months, he was gone. I don't treat this stuff lightly. I don't go up around and God told me, God told me. I, I, I just, it's so insane you hear people talk and all this stuff. God told me, God told me, God told me. And they're using it almost like a, 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 a you know, Yankee dude that stuck a feather in his cap and called it macaroni. They're, they're, it's a thing of pride. It's not scary. It's frightening to hear from God. It's frightening. Whew. Man, many times I perceive certain people are going to die. One time I had a well-known speaker here. If I told his name, his brother is probably one of the best-known preachers in America, almost like a comedian. His, he was, his, his, his younger brother was here preaching. He's moving in the gifts. You know, I'm thinking, whoa, this is God. He's calling out words of knowledge when all of a sudden I perceived he was taking the names of our home group leaders off of the back of our home group flyer. He had memorized their names. He said, so and so and so is here. God has a word for you, the, you know. So when I perceived, I wanted to believe he was flowing in the Holy Ghost, but I perceived he wasn't. So I said, okay, Lord, try the spirits. So I said, the next day, I told a young man, I said, he was about my age, I said, I want to take you out to eat tomorrow. Okay, so I took my wife with me, and I brought the flyer with me in my back pocket. We're sitting down to eat. Everybody thinks, man, he's operating in a word of knowledge. Wow, this is God. And so, you know, I pulled out the flyer, and I, I said, brother, take a look at this. He took the flyer, and he threw it at me. I said, oh, brother. I said, you haven't been operating in a word of knowledge. You've been deceiving people. They ought do it. I said, what? They ought do it. I said, well, I'm not having it here. Well, I won't preach, I won't preach tomorrow, tonight then or tomorrow night, whatever. I think it was that night. I said, you will preach. And I said, there'll be no more shenanigans. I was only in my mid-30s. And he preached, and there was no moving of the gifts or nothing. Didn't even pray for the people, I don't think. See, you got, you got, to, you got to hear from heaven, man. You, you got to know in your heart what's happening. Um, a couple more things. Uh, I had built a homemade swimming pool up on up at our house on the hill. And um, I was trying to save money, which is not good at times. And it was 24 feet across. I took, I cut tongue and groove wood four feet high. Then I put, filled it with sand. I covered it and I put two big steel cables around it, big cables around it. And, um, and, and then I put a liner in it. We filled it up. I don't know how many tons of water was up there. Lots of tons. What if you'd have to calculate how many tons? It's a lot of water. Well, Stephen... And Stephanie, right, were in a swimming pool. And there was the liner. The liner had to develop the little leak. There was a little leak, not a bad leak. And my wife calls me up and says, honey, the swimming pool is leaking. And I said, where's the kids? They're in the pool. I perceived. I said, get them out of the pool right now. Now, usually my wife doesn't respond that quick. This was supernatural. I said, get them out of the pool right now. So she ran out. Now listen, she comes to, there's a big hill drop off, but she comes to this side of the pool and she calls to the kids, come here, Stephen, come here, Stephanie. They normally don't respond real quick, but they swam to her right away. She got them and as she began to pull them out of the pool, the whole pool busted and the, the, the wire swinging like a snake the board swinging, everything, and the whole thing came crashing down and a massive flood to the road below us. Now listen, first of all, if my wife had not got those kids out, they would have been dead. Number two, if she would have gone over there where they were, it would have taken them all out. 
But I perceived, when she called me up and said, Honey, there's a leak in the pool. I perceived something is wrong. I said, Get them out of the pool now. See, I'm telling you, what if I had not perceived? What if I had said, Oh, it's no big deal? They would have been killed. It's, it, we got to hear from God, man. Here's another thing. I have a church up in uh, Chambersburg. <clears throat> Started. I put a man in. I knew it was the will of God, but things weren't right. He cut me off right away. Wanted to get me off of the board. I only stayed on the board to give direction. Some years went by. I'm down in Delaware writing my book on the horse of El Splendors of Heaven, my wife and I. In the, in, in, the, in the early spring where nobody's down on the boardwalk, I get a phone call from this sister who's been on the board for years and said, Brother Mike, something's just not right with Pastor so-and-so. Something's just not right. Something's just not right. Things are falling apart up here. And, 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 and the Lord spoke to me. He said, tell them you're going to have a meeting. And so I called him up and I said, we're having a meeting up there. I'd never stick my nose in, even though he didn't respect me. He was older than I was, you know, and who am I to tell him what to do? But I didn't, I didn't over, I didn't dominate him. So we went up there and we went into the board meeting and here's turning out, he, he's wanting to turn the church over to another church and it turned out there, I knew our way there was money being passed under the table. There was money under the table. I perceived it. God didn't tell me there's money under the table. So... He was so mad because I had authority. He, they, they needed my agreement before they could do that. Now, I, I couldn't go in the church and tell them, do this, do this, do it. But they, they could not sell the church. They could not liquidate it. They could not make major decisions without my agreement because I was the apostle of the work. So we get outside. My wife and I get outside, and he comes storming out. He begins to yell at me and yell at me and scream at me like a madman. My windows rolled down in summertime, and I knew what was going on. I perceived he was involved in adultery. He was cheating on his wife. I just perceived it. I perceived it. He finally deflated. I said, come here, brother, come here. And I took him on my arms. He began to weep and wail and cry. Not telling me a thing yet now. Not telling me anything. Just weeping and wailing and crying. I perceived he got done weeping and wailing and crying. He walked away. It looked like he was humbled. It looked like he was broke. And this time the Lord spoke to me and said, he's going to leave his wife. He's involved in adultery and he will not repent. I said to my wife, Kathy, I said, honey, I said, brother and brother and so is having an affair. She said, I perceive it too. There was nothing that we could know that he was having an affair. There's no lipstick on his collar. There was nothing. Next thing we know, of course, he resigned the church, and I put a new pastor in. Next thing we know, he's left his wife, and he's living with a woman. But this stuff is not coming to my head. It's coming up out of my heart by the Spirit of God. Um, okay, one more story. I, um, I could give you a lot more, but I was down in Suriname. My son and I were in a, men, in a, in a young man's prison. These young men, 12 years old all the way up to 18, were committed to prison for violent, violent crimes, rape, murder, so forth and so on, violent crimes. My son Daniel was supposed to be the one who was to preach. He was 26, I think, 27. So he's trying to preach. It's not coming out. It's not happening. And then he turns it over to me. So I, I'm sharing the word of God, and all of a sudden, I perceived God was going to move through my son Danny in an awesome way. I perceived it. I didn't hear the still small boy say, now I'm going to use your son Danny. I perceived. I looked at Danny. I perceived. I said, Danny, take off. And he began to preach the, one of the most amazing messages I have ever heard, I wish we could have recorded it, on Joseph being in prison. Amazing, amazing. I was sitting there crying almost, and we saw a mighty move of God in all of those young men. Amazing. Well, though, I'm, those men were so broken and so touched, and Danny and I took, and there must have been up to 40 men there, 
and probably Sister Rafis is going to be watching this video because she's an apostle down there that got us into the prison, and she'll confirm this. And we took every one of those men in our arms, and they were weeping, and we were weeping, and we were praying over every one of them. But see, this is how God speaks. We perceive, we see, we know it. We just know it. I, I, hear, I hear Cephas all the time saying, I know it, I just know it, I know it. That's perceiving. It's not the head. You just, I just know it. I just know it. Now, if you find out that you did not know it, what do you do? I'll give you an example. Whenever you're ministering, this is, and we need to teach people how to operate in the gifts of the Spirit. A lot of times I'll see ministers, they got people up here, and a lot of times the word of knowledge is, is, is you just know something about somebody. Sometimes I'll have a vision of it. Sometimes I'll feel the pain. Sometimes I'll see the symptoms. One time I went to pray for a woman, and it was like x-rays, and I saw inside of her chest cavity, and I saw, a, and she didn't tell me what was wrong, and she had a dark cloud in there, and I knew it was a demonic power in her lungs, and I commanded it to come out, and I saw it come out in my, through the eyes of faith, and she was instantly healed. But what will happen is when I go to minister people, I said, <coughs> Now, I, I perceive, I perceive this about you. Is that right? And if they tell me, no, that's not right, I don't argue with them. I don't, no, 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 I heard from God. No, no, that's pride. I don't, no, 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 I heard from God. Because sometimes it might be, it, at one time I went to pray for a woman, and I said, well, I, I perceive that you got this. I, I perceive you got this. And she says, no, I don't have it. I said, okay, maybe I'm missing God. I said, what about you, brother? He said, yeah, that's me. One, another time, I'm at this, this church, this pastor, brother, brother Paul Lebo. Now listen, this is weird, man. This is how God speaks. I'm ministering to people, flowing in the gifts. I look over at Paul's feet, and I see through the leather of his shoes, man, like Superman, and I see his feet are completely consumed with fungus, so bad to where his toenails are falling off. And I said to Paul, Brother Paul, I said, Pastor Paul, yeah. I said, what's going on with your feet? He said, what? I said, they're covered in fungus. He said, oh, I've had that. And he's a man probably in his 60s. He said, I've had that ever since my, my college football years. He said, I don't know what to do. I said, well, God's going to heal you right now. I fell to my knees, laid my hands on his, his feet, and he told me a couple weeks later, the fungus was all gone, and God completely healed him. <laughs> Give the Lord a hand clap and a shout. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So you can go ahead and turn off the... 